comfortable, spread it out a little bit. Um, go ahead and turn with me over in your Bibles, over to Matthew. Um, Matthew, chapter 1. We're going to be in verses uh, 17 through 25 today. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 17 through 25. Um, say Matthew for me. Matthew. Matthew. Turn to your neighbor to your left or your right and say Matthew. Matthew. Turn there. <laughs> Turn there. Yeah, you shall say it. Turn there. Okay. Matthew chapter 1, um, verses 17 through 25 is where we're going to plan ourselves. Let me encourage you to take out something to take notes. And uh, um, just uh, and if you need pens, paper, or anything, hopefully we are a sharing bunch. Generous, and we're sharing and allowing. And if you look on, if you have a worship folder, if you look on the back lot, there's a place for you to take notes as well. Um, but we've been going through, and we began this year, and we're just walking through the Book of Matthew. And uh, um, in no hurry of a pace, we're just seeing what God wants to teach us through uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And we have just made it through the genealogy. We're going to try to move on there, but before we do. Think about this for a minute. Um, when we look at the genealogy, and if you haven't had the opportunity to be with us, you're new with us, or have uh, not been able to be through already through this year some of the teaching times, let me encourage you to go to our website or go to our YouTube channel, and you can catch up, um, specifically as we've walked through some things that try to highlight in the genealogy. But think about it. None of us can actually choose the relatives that we have. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. I'm not going to leave it alone. But getting, getting an amen there, um, we can't do anything with it. We can't even do anything with our melodies. Um, I'm a lost words there. And that, that doesn't happen very often. Um, you know, think about though, as much as sometimes we might want to do something about our genealogy or about our relatives, Jesus actually could have. You know, he could have cleaned up his lineage if he wanted to. He could have made it perfect. Um, or let's just say that the authors, specifically as we look at the genealogy of the life of Jesus and look at his genealogy, we could have said, well, let's leave this part out and, 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 and all these sort of things, but that's not what we see. You know, in many terms, you, you wouldn't even want to list, uh, when you look at this genealogy and look through it, include the people that, just think about it, a lot of times we say, are you kidding me? I can't believe that these, this is part of Jesus' genealogy. This is part of Jesus' family. This is in the line of Jesus. Think about it. People always say, hey, did, did you know, I think, but did you know the prostitute, Rahab? Now, how many are going to answer? Yes, I know her. Think about that for a minute. You know, but... She's in the lineage of Jesus. What about David? You know, thinking about this whole thing of David and Bathsheba thing. You know, do we really have to be highlight that in the genealogy? That's a little embarrassing. Can we just leave that part out? But here's the thing. One of the things that I love about the whole story of Jesus is looking and seeing that Jesus, leaving the realms of heaven... And coming and walking amongst his creation. And doing life with humanity. Doing life with his creation. And, and, and therefore being understanding the various things that we experience and we go through. Even with some sketchy relatives. Just like us. Jesus was all about what seemed, he, he, he even delights in rescuing and rebuilding and restoring relationships and families and even genealogies. Now, moving from this part of the Gospel of Matthew into the next part, looking at verse 17 of chapter 1. Now, if you look at verse 17, I just want to highlight this for you before we move on to verse 18, 21. If you look at verse 17, it says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until, 
until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon uh, to Christ are 14 generations. So you have these 14 generations, but that's... It, let me just... Uh, do we have any math buffs in the audience that you just... You're all about math. Anybody? No? Yes! Because I'm not either. <laughs> But I just saw, I want to just paint this picture for you. But this is remarkable. What is it? Everything that you, we see here is in multiples of, of seven di divisible by seven. In other words, I just throw this out there to you. If you're really a map buff, one of, one of the studies, and maybe if you're looking for a study to go in, is to see the connection with math and scripture. Just throwing it out there. It is truly amazing. And I don't want to dive into all that today. I just want to paint that picture for you because I really want to highlight this next part that we want to go into. In fact, over the next several weeks, we're going to spend some time really diving into the life of this specific individual. Because the next section uh, of our text, verses 18 through 25, really seems like a Christmas text. In fact, we actually talked about this individual in our Christmas series through December. We actually talked about him uh, a little bit, but we're going to really dive into his life a little bit more. Because what happens is we tend to overlook this part of the Christmas story. And they even brought this out when we talked about Joseph during Christmas time. See, over Christmas, we kind of look past Joseph's life, and we look into the life of Mary. And I want to just stop and really dissect this part of what Matthew is sharing with us. So Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. I want to begin verse 18 and just follow along. Now it's on the screens behind me as well. Um, but let me encourage you, if you can and feel comfortable, even if you don't have a Bible with you, maybe scoot over and close enough to someone where you can share or something like that. Um, but look, I want us to see this. Jump off the pages to us, or maybe off the screens. It says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. Say Joseph for me. Yes. <laughs> but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. Now you see this word righteous right here? I want you to circle or underline that word righteous. And when you see righteous and then man, I want you to put a circle or a box, or I want you to highlight this man right here. So he was in, uh, so Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So underline that. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. How did he decide to break off the engagement? Quietly. He wanted to do it loud? No, quietly. What does quietly mean? Quiet. Quietly? <laughs> uh, I'm not, not, not just being smart. It's quietly. What <laughs> means quietly? He didn't want people to know about it. And so he considered this, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in what? What did the angel of the Lord appear to him? Dream. dream. Appeared to him in a dream. So circle or highlight that. How the angel of the Lord appeared. To Joseph, in a dream. To Joseph, the son of David, the angel said, Do not be, he what? Afraid. Afraid. So circle that or highlight that. To take Mary as your wife. What is the angel telling Joseph? The angel's telling Joseph, Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. So do you see this? The angel is saying, don't be afraid. I'm giving you a glimpse into what is going on. The Holy Spirit has come upon her. She is with child. And even the angel shares with Joseph the name that you are to name. It's not like they have to go through. Okay, once he finds out, you know, how many of you have ever what, seen all these names and all these, you know, you're going through and you're trying to name your child or different stuff like that, and you have the name, you know, you know the books that have all the names in it. Anybody ever been part of that before? Yeah. You know what your name means? 
Anybody know what Samantha means? Sweet. Anybody know what the name Jonathan means? Let me just tell you. I use this quite often with my mom and dad. A gift from God. Oh, there's there. There's there. You should know what your name means. Anyway. So, so written on her. Um, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So what is he going to do? Jesus, he will save his people. So underline that, circle that. He's going to save his people from their sins. So he's telling him, okay, here's what's going on. This is how Mary became pregnant. This is, the, the, you're going to have a son. This is what you are to name him. And he's actually saying, this is the purpose. This is the mission. This is the life that your son is going to live. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophets. So in other words, we're going to talk about this later on several weeks from now, but we're going to look and see how actually this is a fulfillment of prophecy and what that means to Joseph and to Mary. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him what? And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the, as the Lord commanded. So what did Joseph do when he woke up? He did as the Lord had commanded. Highlight that, circle that. And he took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. focus on Joseph. You see, Mary oftentimes gets all the press, and rightfully so. If you go to a wedding, whose eyes, who, who do we watch at the wedding? The bride. the bride. Might as well the groom might not be there, right? He better be there. He better show up, but ain't nobody watching the groom. Ain't nobody saying, oh man, the groom, he looks so awesome. Nobody's saying that, are they? No, they're saying, oh, how beautiful the bride. Oh, that is so special. Oh, everybody, just, the first time you see the bride, everybody just like, oh, you know, so bad when you see the bride. <laughs> so I say that Mary oftentimes gets all the press. Mary is, is in twice so herself. She's an amazing young woman, a teenager. If you can imagine, some scholars believe say that anywhere between, and it's debated, but anywhere between the age of 13 to 16 years, most have kind of settled on the age of 14. Think about that. 14 years of age, the mother of Jesus. She's just a teenager and an amazing young lady. But I think we have to stop and think about the dad. We have to stop and think about Joseph. See, Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, y'all get that? Y'all realize that? Mm -hmm. Stepfather of Jesus? Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, is kind of an incredible guy, and I just want to, I kind of want to walk through six attributes of Joseph. Now, we're not going to walk through all six today. We're going to kind of, we're going to really take some time over the next several weeks and kind of just look at these attributes. But I want to just kind of dive into these attributes. So on your outline, or as you're taking notes, write attributes uh, of a seed of Jesus. That I believe that if we will look at these and dissect these, we will apply them and try to apply them to our lives, that we will help us move us uh, in a way closer to Jesus. Y'all tracking with me so far? Mm -hmm. I got me? Okay. So here's the first thing, or here's the first one of Joseph. Joseph was a man... Self-control. He was self-controlled. He was a self-controlled man. And, and, and when we look at this, uh, specifically the idea of sexual self-control. Look what it says back in verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. So what's going on here? We'll talk about this here in a little bit more minute. So we see that Mary is engaged to Joseph. 
It goes on to say, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about this idea of being engaged. Or as some of your translations may say, um, in the New Living Translation, that a lot often that I preach from, it says that engaged, but in a lot of your translations, it might say espoused or betrothed. Do anybody have that? Some of that? No? Okay. It, it's something that we don't have in our culture today. We, we, um, we have uh, the idea of engagement. And that's kind of what, you know, you have this uh, couple, they start dating, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, things go from one thing to another, and then eventually we have this engagement, engagement says, okay, we're going to get engaged, and then we know which engagement is leading to what? It's leading to marriage, hopefully, right? But in this time, in this culture, when you see this idea, you have this engagement period, which was a more loosely sincere attempt at saying that we're going to get married someday, but then you would become or move into this idea of espouse or betroth to your wife, and that was a, at this time in this culture, was another step, another step, another tier, if you will, that we don't have in our culture today. And it was very serious. It was more like a locked-in engagement. It was, in fact, you were so locked in that if you actually broke this, your espousal, you'd still have to write a bill of divorce if you were to break up with your spouse or with this part of the engagement. It's like saying you're technically married. Y'all tracking along with me right now? It's like you're saying you're technically married just without the consummation of the marriage. And that's what a spousal period was. They, and they had, as a, is a very important part of their culture uh, that sort of was stemming from the idea of their parents. See, during specifically in this culture at this time, how many of you actually chose, if you're married, or have, were married, or have been married, chose your spouse? Raise your hand if you chose your spouse. Or a mom. If mom and dad chose your spouse for your grandma, grandma, or aunt, uncle, somebody chose your spouse, raise your hand. What did you say? I said, if mom or dad, or grandma or grandpa, or aunt and uncle chose your spouse for you, raise your hand. See, this is more in the culture and in line with where mom and dad actually at a very young age, say about kindergarten, would <laughs> come together with another family and say, guess what? We think that our two children need to marry. Now, for some of us, we might say, well, that doesn't sound like it's such a bad idea. Well, that's sort of in this culture where all this comes from, with this idea of kind of a loose engagement, then all of a sudden then we move into a more serious engagement where actually, if you separated, you had to write a letter of divorce even before you actually got to the idea of marriage and consummation. See, Joseph was self-controlled man. See, this idea, the idea that we see in Scripture of abstinence, see, the Bible actually teaches there is value in virginity, and Joseph and Mary are, you know, they're espoused to be married. Think about it in our culture today. This is something that we don't really see a lot in our culture. In fact, a lot of times we've gone the opposite direction. They're taking, actually, during this time with Jesus and Jesus' mom and dad, they actually would take marriage to a whole new level. We've actually gone to the opposite direction, and sometimes we've made it so easy that say, hey, you know, we can, if you don't, well, I don't like you anymore. I don't want to be with you anymore. It's over. And always we made it that simple. In fact, someone was telling me this week, I, and they had been reading a, a, um, a, a book on relationships. And they came to me afterward, a young adult came to me after reading this book and um, sharing with me. We're talking about different things, talking about relationships. said, marriage is the real deal. Uh, in fact, uh, marriage actually scares me. 
<laughs> so it scares you. Why? Because once you're in married, you're married. Amen. You know? You're married. And this young adult was saying, you know? And, and it made me think, and then Susan and I were actually in a conversation just yesterday, and we were talking about this whole idea of relationships and how we just really don't, how we've, the pendulum has really swung culturally. And how we look at relationships, how we look at a husband and a wife. We even look at this idea and the whole idea of sex and all that. Think about Mary and Joseph. They're, you know, in, in this idea of this culture, they're basically saying, you know, hey, you know, all we we're, we're basically married, so don't you think we ought to see if we're compatible with one another? No, don't you see? Don't you? What, what, what about if we just tried to live together for a while, try to figure all this out and see, see, you know, I, I need to find out if you snore or not. I need to find out. I need to find out if all this is going to work. See where I'm going with this? Our culture today. That's how we've kind of just swung the pedal a little bit. Maybe not just a little bit, but a whole lot. See, Joseph, Joseph was a man who was self-controlled. He had self-control. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure one of you can correct me afterwards, whether it be online or in person, but if I'm not mistaken, you can go back and if you will look and read through what the, the fruit of the Spirit Will we not find that self-control is one of those fruits? Just throwing that out there. Because don't think that culture doesn't make its way into the church. And if you are a follower of Christ, if you are a Christian, if you've surrendered your life to Christ, one of the gifts you receive is the Holy Spirit. And if you receive the Holy Spirit and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Just say, I'll leave it there. Y'all track on me? So Joseph was a man of self-control, but not only was a man of self-control, but the second thing I want us to look at today was that Joseph, Joseph was a He was a gentleman. Some of you are a gentleman. Who wants to be gentle? Men, oh! Don't want to be gentle. Men aren't supposed to be gentle. In fact, let me just say this. This, this idea right here, gentle, is so such a serious thing that next weekend we're going to spend a whole service on this idea. This idea of being gentle. Because I want you to look what it says here in verse 19. It says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, verse 19, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement off quietly. Now, you can you imagine just being Joseph? You know, so often I will talk about we need, and it's important as we look through Scripture, to actually put ourselves there. And, and, and so often we read Scripture, and we just read it, and we remove ourselves from it. We remove our feelings from it. We remove the idea. We talked about this even during Christmas time when Mary and Joseph, a young adult, Mary, a mom, and Joseph, and all this, and, and being young, and, and what it must have been like first-time parents and trying to figure all this out. Don't remove yourself from that. Allow yourself to be absorbed in it, to feel it. So can you imagine being Joseph and then finding out the excitement of knowing, okay, we're in this place in our relationship, moving toward this spot in our marriage and, and, and where we're actually husband and wife, and then finding out that you're a spouse, wife, finding out that she is actually pregnant. 
A lot of times we don't think about from Joseph's perspective. What do you do? During this culture, during this time, with Mary and Joseph that we're reading about, there was a thing that you did that had to do with the law of Moses. And if you remember, um, there's a time when Jesus is walking and he, and he comes across, there, there's this woman that, that has been actually sort of just, they, they kind of all come together. There's this woman and there's this group of people, specifically these men that are following her and they have these stones in their hand and they confront you and say, what do you think we should do? And they're getting ready to stone this woman of adultery. Anybody familiar with that story? If not, come see me afterwards and I'll put you up where you can find that. They're getting ready to stone, and Jesus, you know, we don't know what exactly, you know, this is the time period, if you're familiar with, where Jesus actually, he starts to write something on the ground. Now, we're not sure exactly what he was writing. Some believe that maybe he started writing out maybe some of their sins and different stuff or some things that maybe they tried to hide, started writing them out. We're not really sure, but one by one, each dropped their rocks, and there was just this woman in front of Jesus. See, they were trying to follow the law of Moses here that said that she should be stoned to death. And that's the way they would handle this during that time and culture that we're looking at with Mary and Joseph. Here's this young married Mary who's pregnant. She's in a dangerous, and maybe you never thought of it that way. She's in a dangerous situation. People really don't realize that. They don't really look at it from the Christmas story that, hey, when she informed Joseph that she's pregnant, what actually she's, how much danger she was actually in. She can't just walk in and say, hey, guess what? I'm pregnant. The typical rule here of the land was that Joseph would declare this girl and make a public thing about it. And even in some cultures, even in today's society, they do this. They still do this. But here's the thing that I've noticed. I don't know if you noticed it. And back with Jesus and what we just talked about, when they were getting ready to stone this woman, and even in the... You, Where's the guy? Where's the guy? It's always the woman. You never see the two of them. As far as I know, it takes two to tangle. And you don't see the guy. You see, Joseph, in a normal situation, would have said, Mary's pregnant, and I have to, and I had nothing to do with it. So they would take her out and they would stone her to death. They would just keep piling rocks and throwing rocks and rocks after rock after rock until you would see uh, eventually as the individual would fall, as the woman would fall, and the rocks would just continue to pile up and then they would just walk away. That's how they stoned a person to death. And Joseph wants nothing to do with that. Joseph doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And here's what I believe. I believe it's because he genuinely loves Mary. Now stick with me. I believe it's because he loves Mary. And even though at this point he doesn't know it's the Holy Spirit that's made Mary pregnant, he doesn't have a grasp of what's going on. He still doesn't know. He's thinking in his mind, you know what, I don't want to make a public show of this. I don't want to follow through. I know it's the law, but I don't want to do this. I want to get, I want to, I want to do this privately. I want to cover this up. By the way, did y'all know that that's something the Bible teaches us? About love actually covers? Did you know that the Bible actually over and over again teaches about this idea of love actually covers? You know, it's interesting because in marriage, I've noticed there are down through the years of different couples, and I 
I'm sure that you have met them too and, 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 and dealt with different relationships. Well, there's some couples that just like to keep a list of all the wrongs that their spouse does. Don't look to the left or the right. <laughs> Don't use your elbow. You ever run or been with couples or something like that? Are you here? You know, my husband does this. Or my wife does this. Or she did that. That's just a sinful uncovering of your spouse. And I don't think that's what God intended for marriage to look like. Can I just say why I'm there? Well, even if I can't say it, I'm going through anyway. If you find yourself walking around reminding your husband or your wife or your friends or your kids or your grandkids of all their wrongdoings, that's not of God. Can I just say that again? I didn't get an amen. I'm not saying it needs an amen. I'm just throwing it out there. If you find yourself or associating, associating with that you they're just they're constantly just going through, walking around reminding their spouse, their wife, their husband, or friends, or kids or grandkids of all their wrongs that they've been doing over the past week or month or years, reminding them, bringing them up to the forefront. Over and over and over again. That's not of God. Amen. You see, Joseph, he's gentle. He's not trying to nail or pin her down for messing up or for sinning. Because we have to understand, at this point, that's what Joseph has to think is going on. He has to think that she has betrayed him. Have you ever wondered, ever thought about how Joseph had to be thinking at this point? Did you ever, did you ever realize that Joseph maybe is thinking, well, who's the other guy? How did I miss this? I thought she loved me like I loved her. What's going on here? See, Joseph is thinking, how is he going to deal with this? But he does it gently. Look what 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. It says this thing. Above all things, have fervent charity. Now, the word charity here in some translations also is the word love. So you can put out there the word love. It says, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall, or love shall cover the multitudes of sins. What shall cover the multitude of sins? Charity, or as I said, some churches will say the word love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Now, don't misconstrue this. I'm not saying... Because there is wrong, it, it's wrong to cover up sin. <clears throat> so don't read, don't think. Sin, sin. And I have to say that because there's always people who, who, who don't get it. it. In other words, if, if you've sinned and you know that you've done something and you're trying to cover it up so that you don't get caught in this horrible thing, that is sin itself. That's not right. There needs to be open transparency with sin and confession and dealing with it. But here's the thing, what I am trying to get us to see. At the same time, when it comes to this idea of being a Christ follower, being a follower of Jesus Christ, instead of walking around being a, I like this term. Y'all don't mind, do this for me. Go, anybody smell any sin? Y'all know what I'm talking about. There are at times in the church, and when I say church, I have capital C church, the church. 
They're what we call the sin sniffers. You know what I'm talking about? I smell sin. Sin somewhere. I smell it. So let me ask you. Are you a sin sniffer? Sniffer? Or are you sensitive? Or are you a fault finder? See, again, I'm noticing again in the church, capital C, there are those people who are running around and they just, they're trying to sniff out sin. They're trying to smell where is it at. They just can't wait to let people know or uncover. And I see it all in it specifically down in our culture even recently. Yes, there has been some things that have happened in the church, and I mean capital C church, with different leaders within the church, and yes, uh, sin and all that, but there's some people that have walked around and they can't wait to catch it. They can't wait to bring it to light. In fact, that's what they're itching for. In fact, they think that's what their purpose and their calling in ministry. What their mission in the church is. No, our mission is to go make disciples, not to point it out. Amen. Our mission is to go make disciples and to baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I've commanded. There are those that just can't wait to let people know and uncover. But that's really not the behavior of a follower of Christ. You might think, well, man, I'm not sure about all this. I think maybe he's just got on his little wobbly horse or something like that. <laughs> well, I want to show you what I'm talking about. God's word speaks into this. I want, I want you to see a story that... Maybe, I bet you're familiar, how many are familiar with Noah? Raise your hand if you're familiar with the story of Noah. If you went to Sunday school as a kid or vacation Bible school, I bet you painted, or not necessarily painted, maybe you did, or you, you actually talked about the, the promise of the rainbow and the flood and the ark, and maybe you colored pictures, and maybe on the, if you're old enough, you had the felt boards. Anybody remember the felt boards? And you put the felt, oh, oh Johnny, would you put Noah here and put the animals going in the boat? Anybody relate to that? Yeah? Some of you? But I bet none of you on the felt board or none of you actually colored this time in Noah's life. In Noah chapter 9, there's this story. There's a story that, that I want you to see. So you need to turn over to Genesis chapter 9. And I just kind of run through. I'm not going to read it, but you can read it more this week. But it goes like this. Noah... After they landed, after he said, Noah goes into his, after, uh, goes into his tent, he strips down naked, he gets totally smashed, he gets drunk, and there's Noah in his tent laying completely naked, dancing around, you see there for a while, and he's just in his tent. And Noah's son... <laughs> Ham, say Ham for me. Ham. Noah's son Ham comes and sees his dad naked and says to his brothers, Sham, say Sham for me. Ham. Say Japheth for me. So Ham comes to his brothers, Sham and Japheth, and he says, Get over here, check it out. And Sham and Japheth, they, they, they do something that's a little strange. See, Ham, did you see what? In other words, Noah, he goes into the tent. He, he, you see there, there's this vineyard that they had grown. He goes in, he, he takes from the vineyard. He gets smashed. He's in his tent. He dances around, completely naked. He eventually just collapses there. Ham finds him. He says, brothers, come. I want you to see that. But they don't look in the tent. 
Instead, they take off their cloak and they put it between their shoulders and they make this curtain. So they're standing there, Shem and Japheth, Ham's going, hey guys, I said, look, here's dad in the tent. But they make a curtain and they walk toward the opening of the tent backwards. <coughs> they walk backwards, not looking at their dad's nakedness, but covering up the door and making it so nobody else can see. That's one of the early stories that we see actually right here in Scripture of this notion that love covers. <coughs> Write this in your notes if you don't, if you haven't yet. Love love covers. Love covers. It's kind of interesting that there, because Shem and Japheth, they, if you remember, if you're familiar with the story, you can read later on this week, you will see that they were blessed. They were blessed because of what they did. But Ham, who ex actually exposed the sin and said, hey, to his brothers, I want you to come, I want you to check out that. Well, he got cursed. And he became the father of the land. Anybody familiar with the Canaanites? <clears throat> Maybe a light bulb just went off. Oh yeah, Canaanites, land of Canaan, cursed now. Oh. See him. Is cursed. Actually, they curse the people, and they're all they're cursed. See this idea of covering of sin. The Bible actually teaches. Well, just you can jot these down. They'll be up on the screens, but and you can look at them later or see them on the screens. But in First John uh, verse nine, it says this: If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all what unrighteousness. Go ahead and flip to the other one. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Hmm. Be baptized. Have your sins what? Washed away. away. Hmm. Baptized. Have your sins washed away. By the calling on the name of whom? Lord. The Lord. Go to the next one. This means, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 or 7, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become what? You. A new person or a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life has what? Begun. Has begun. See, I love this idea. We are, hopefully this will just seek within our bones. We love when it becomes who we are. And we love this idea of the covering of sin. Because that is exactly what Jesus does. Even as Joseph is trying to figure it out. Joseph doesn't want to make a big deal out of this. His desire was to cover and do things. Why not believe he wants to cover? Because he really loves her. He cared about her. And can I just say this? I, I, I just don't want to say, I, I bet there's some of you right now. We talked about this in the service. I bet there's just some of you right now that are still struggling in a life of guilt. Some of you, I bet, have been struggling and allowing guilt just to rip at you for years. We all have to understand Go, y'all do this too. You smell it? It's sin. Yeah. It's there. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. We paint this 
picture, we look at people in different ways. Well, no, I'm not like them. I'm not like, we like to put them all in categories. We like to say, well, no, I'm not as bad as them. You know, we like, even when we look through scripture, we look at different scriptures, we'll say, well, that's sin. That's a horrible sin. But then we look at this sin like gossip, and we go, oh, that's not so bad. Sin, sin. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. And some of us are just, we allow Satan just to beat and beat and beat and beat and beat on us. And some of you right now are still allowing Satan to beat on you. And you haven't held on to the promises. And you're not holding on to the promises. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. But the good news is, if any man be in Christ or a woman be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Don't forget, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things become new. Put in the bottom of your notes, that is a promise. <coughs> that is a promise. <coughs> First two things this weekend that I want to encourage us to start to apply to our lives. And as a follower of Christ, Having the Holy Spirit as one of those gifts of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. If you are a follower of Christ, if you've surrendered your life to Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The fruit of the Spirit. One of those fruit is self-control. Another one is what? I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's gentleness. Is it not? I don't know. Y'all can say that. Too. Huh. Did you ever realize that in the life of Joseph? He was a man of self-control. He was a gentleman. Next time, we'll look at the third attribute. Okay? Next weekend, this idea here of gentleness, I, I believe in it so wholeheartedly that we're actually going to spend the entire worship experience looking at this idea. So I want to encourage you to be back with us next weekend and to be a part of what God is trying to do through us and in us. Can you stand with me? Thanks.